Today we're going to dive a little bit into the topological definition of continuity. And we're going to do that by looking at my favorite function, the floor function, and asking the question, where is this floor function continuous? And well, what I, even do I mean by where? Well, we'll get to that. But before we do, let's look at this graph of the floor function. Recall that the floor function is like an elevator down to the closest integer. So everything between 0 and 1 is mapped to 0. And that's inclusive of 0 but exclusive of 1. And then everything between 1 and 2 is mapped to 1. Again, inclusive of 1 but exclusive of 2. And then so on and so forth as we go up this staircase. So as you can see, by the typical definition of continuity, we have discontinuities at every integer. And these are sometimes called jump discontinuities. Okay, so now I'd like to look at three levels of continuity. And I've got two of them on the board. And then after looking at these two, I'll maybe introduce the third one towards like our final goal. So let's look at maybe the first definition that you learn in like a calculus one type class. And that says that f is continuous at a if the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a. So this tells you that the limit not only exists and the function exists, but those are the same quantity. And then sometimes if your professor is like brave, they introduce this precise definition of continuity in a first semester calculus class, or you might have to wait until an advanced calculus class or a real analysis class. But the proper real analysis definition of continuity goes like this. So f is continuous at a if for all epsilon bigger than zero, there is a delta bigger than zero, so that if x is on the interval from a minus delta to a plus delta, then f of x is on the interval from f of a minus epsilon to f of a plus epsilon. The important thing here is that we are given an epsilon and then this delta likely depends on the epsilon. And this is written maybe without the inequalities, but with something equivalent to the inequalities where we put us inside of these open intervals. Okay, so now let's look at this as a picture over here. So let's notice here I've got a function which is definitely continuous at A by all like standard ways of thinking of continuity. And let's map over here this point F of A. And so notice our precise definition says that for all epsilon bigger than zero, there is a delta. But before we get to that, notice that epsilon is buffering out the space around f of a. So maybe we would put like some open circles here, open because these are open intervals, and then shade in between. So this would be something that I might call an epsilon neighborhood of f of a. So now let's maybe underline this in the same magenta color and that corresponds to that neighborhood over there or that open interval along the range space. Okay, now, now that we've got it. So for all epsilon bigger than zero, there is a delta bigger than zero such that if x is between a minus delta and a plus delta, then f of x is, well, in this place that we've already built. Okay, so let's see if we can find a delta, and in this case, it's fairly easy. Notice that we could map this lower thing right across. We can map just the lower thing right across because locally that function is decreasing there. And then we could map that down. Good, and that would give us this thing right here. Then we could map this upper point across as well, but notice that we never intersect the graph again, or we don't locally at least. So that means we could really go as far as we wanted to to the right, but since we're like centering this at A, we'll just go this same distance. So that'll be like right there. Great. And now I'll shade in here, and the radius of this interval, or maybe half the length, if you will, will be the number that we call delta. And then let's maybe underline this in blue to say what's going on there. 
And now let's just check. If x comes from this blue interval, does it get mapped into the magenta interval? Well, I think we can see that it does. Notice that this value of x would get mapped up over here, which is in the magenta interval. Notice maybe a value of x over here would also get mapped into, well, a pretty similar place inside of the magenta um, interval. Needless to say, by visual inspection, everything in that blue interval will get mapped to the magenta interval. Okay, so now I'd like to translate this definition to what I'll call um, neighborhood uh, language. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, what I wanna think about is that this magenta interval is really a neighborhood of f of a, and this blue interval is a neighborhood of b. So now let's rewrite our definition of continuity using these ideas of neighborhoods. So f is continuous at a if for every open neighborhood of f of a, so every open neighborhood is every possible interval of this type. Well, it's a little bit more general than that, but it's essentially that sort of idea. So this is like the given epsilon right here. Okay, maybe we'll give this open neighborhood a name as well, n. Okay, so let's look over it again. F is continuous at A if for every open neighborhood of F of A, which we'll call n, well, we need something to happen. So maybe based off of this, we would say there exists an open neighborhood of A that gets mapped into that open neighborhood of N. But I think we can do a little bit better. And we're gonna do better with the pre-image operation. So let's take the pre-image of N. So we'll write that as like F inverse of N. And this will be equal to all X in the domain. So I'll just write X such that f of x is inside of this neighborhood. And what we need this to be is an open neighborhood of A. So is an open neighborhood of A. And this isn't exactly the same as this blue condition here, but it's pretty close. Notice for this definition, maybe we would take this magenta to be our open neighborhood of F of A. Maybe we're calling that N. And then the pre-image here would be quite a bit bigger. Notice the pre-image in this case, well, it would start at the same place, but then it would extend infinitely to the right. So that would be the open neighborhood of A that, well, gets mapped onto this open neighborhood that is the magenta color. Okay, so now all of this is pushing towards what I'll call the topological definition of continuity. So let's present that. So via that exploration, we were really pushing towards the following definition. And this is the general topological definition of continuity. So f, a function from x to y, is continuous if for every open set v of y, the pre-image of v is an open subset of x. Let's recall that the pre-image is everything in the domain that gets mapped to v. Okay, but here's a major question. And what the heck is an open set in the first place? Well, this depends on the context. Depending on how we want to study these two spaces, we may define open sets differently. And maybe the way to say this traditionally would be to say it depends on the topology of X and Y. So that being said, there's a standard topology of the real numbers where the open sets are built from open intervals, those intervals like A comma B that don't include A or B. So notice that will also include the empty set, like that would be the open interval, for example, from zero to zero, as well as everything. That would be like the open interval minus infinity to infinity. And so the open sets are built from open intervals. That gives you this standard topology. And since it gives you the standard topology, it should probably give you the standard idea of continuity, and it does. And let's just look at that via an example. So let's look at the function f of x equals x squared. 
And let's take an open interval in the codomain or the range space and look at its pre-image. Let's say the open interval we're looking at starts here at 1 and goes up here maybe to 4. So this is not a general open set or anything. This is not a proof that this thing is con continuous. This is just sort of like some intuition for what's going on here. And now let's find the pre-image of this magenta line. Okay, so we would probably map over here and then down. It's pretty easy to see that this point right here is one. And then we would map over here and down. And you would see that this point right here is two. And so you would get, at least as part of it, this open interval between one and two. But we'd also have to go in this direction. So that would go over here to this point, which you know, I think we can probably say is negative one. And then this would go over here to this point, which is negative two. And you would get everything in between those as well. And notice if we take any point x between 1 and 2, it definitely gets mapped into our space from 1 to 4. And likewise, if we take any point x between negative 2 and negative 1, it also gets mapped into the correct space. So I think we can see here that in this case, the pre-image of the interval from one to four is the disjoint union of these two open intervals. And that's where I mean that open sets are built from open intervals. They're not just open intervals, but they're open intervals and also unions of open intervals. Okay, so now let's show that in the standard topology, this is not continuous by this definition that we have up here. And then look at a new topology where it is continuous. Now we're going back to my favorite function, the floor function, and we'll show using this topological definition of continuity that the floor function is not continuous in the standard topology, of course, this Euclidean topology where all open sets are built from open intervals. And so how we'll do this is take an open interval over here in the range, or I guess I should say the codomain, take its pre-image and show that that pre-image is not open. Now, of course, we have to like carefully or potentially carefully choose our open interval over there, but it shouldn't be too bad. Let's take this open interval that starts here at one half and then goes up here to one and a half. So that's three halves. Okay, great. And now if we were to map that across, we would see that everything between one and two gets mapped into this set. It's a little bit different than something we've seen before because this is a constant function on that interval, but that's what we get. So maybe I'll shade this in blue here, and then this is an open circle. So that might seem a little bit strange because it's next to this thing, which is oppositely shaded, but this is the output of the function, and this is the pre-image of our magenta. Now let's just make sure everything works. So notice that this point right here, x equals one, gets mapped up here, but that's across and that is inside of our open interval. And then likewise, if we map here and across, we're still inside of our open interval and so on and so forth. So I think the proof here is to simply consider the pre-image of this set. So let's introduce some notation to do it. Let's set f of x equal to the floor function. And then we'll note that the interval from one half to three halves is open in R, but the interval that goes from one to two, but includes one, is not open in R. And I guess the real important thing here is that this interval from one to two is the pre-image of this interval from one half to three halves. So there we found it. We found an open set over here in the codomain whose pre-image is not open over there in the domain. So that means this is not a continuous function. Okay, so that being said, one of the whole purposes of this video was to tweak the topology on R in order to make this into a continuous function.
And now we'll do that with something called the lower limit topology. And that's generally denoted by an R with an L subscript. Okay, so now we have to determine what our open sets are built from here. So now the open sets are built from the following type of half open interval that includes the left hand endpoint. Okay, but now we see that the floor function is continuous. And I'm gonna write this as starting at R sub L, which is R with the lower limit topology and ending at R, which is R with the standard topology. So this is continuous in this setting. And of course, this up here isn't a proof, this is just an example of the behavior working out, but it's useful to write down. Notice that in this setup, the pre-image of one half to three halves is this half open, you know, it's a little bit dangerous to call it half open, but this interval one to two that includes one, but not two, which is in fact open in this lower limit topology. So there we did it. We constructed a topology on R where this thing that looks like a discontinuous function is in fact continuous. And I would say like the major takeaway here is that context matters when you're working with mathematical ideas. Math is often built up so that there's only one correct answer. And perhaps that's true some of the time, like in basic math classes, like with arithmetic or probably even like calculus one type problems. But if you go further and further and further, you'll find more cases like this happening where you can contextually look at different topologies on spaces and see that functions are continuous in some topologies and not continuous in other topologies. And this isn't just in topology, this is in lots of like higher mathematics ideas. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.